The young man of today, said Mr. Behrens, is physically stronger and fitter than his father. He can run a mile quicker, he can jump higher, and will probably live longer. Not as long as the young lady of today, said Mr. Calder. They have a look of awful vitality. Nevertheless, said Mr. Behrens, he and Mr. Calder, being very old friends, didn't so much answer as override each other. Nevertheless, he is in one important way inferior to the older generation. He is mentally softer. He is tolerant, but he is flabby. What's worrying you, said Mr. Calder. The future of our service, said Behrens. Mr. Behrens, who lived down in the valley, had walked up as he did regularly on Tuesday afternoons to take tea with Mr. Calder in his cottage on the hilltop. You could be right on this occasion, Mr. Calder said. I saw Fortescue yesterday. And then he added, there's a woman. She has to be killed. Anyone I know, said Mr. Behrens. Not sure. Her name at the moment is Lipper, Maria Lipper. She lives in Woking and is known there as Mrs. Lipper. She has worked as a filing clerk at the Air Ministry since, oh, since well before the last war. Both Mr. Behrens and Mr. Calder spoke of the last war in terms of very slight derogation. It had not been their war. And how long has she been working for them? Certainly for ten years, possibly more. Security got onto her in the end by selective coding, and that, as you know, is a very slow process. And not one which a jury would understand or accept. Oh, certainly not, said Mr. Calder. Certainly not. Maria Lipper is a season ticket holder, not a commuter. By this, Mr. Calder meant that Maria Lipper was an agent who collected piecemeal all information which came her way and passed it on at long intervals of months or even years. When she had sufficient to interest her masters, she would take it to a collecting point and leave it. Occasional sums of money would come to her through the post. What is Fortescue going to do about it? The contact has been short-circuited, said Mr. Calder. I'm taking his place. Two days from now, Mrs. Lipper is driving down to Portsmouth for a short holiday. She plans to leave Woking very early, and she'll be crossing Salisbury Plain at six o'clock. Outside Upaven, she turns off the main road. The meeting place is a barn at the top of the track. She's asked for a payment of five hundred pounds in one-pound notes. He sighed. It is a sad commentary on the younger generation that a man of my age has to be sent out on a trip like this. Exactly what I was saying, said Mr. Behrens. Now, where did you put the backgammon board? Mr. Calder left his cottage at dusk on the following evening. A mile from Upaven, he pulled up at the side of the road and studied his map. The track leading to the barn was clearly shown. Near it, Mr. Calder saw in straggling Gothic lettering the words... Slay down. The entrance to the track had been shut off by a gate. The gate was padlocked, but Mr. Calder dealt with this by lifting it off its hinges. It was heavy, but there were surprising reserves of strength in his barrel-shaped body, thick arms and plump hands. The track was rock hard. Mr. Calder ran up it until he guessed that he was on the top of the rise. There he backed his car into a thicket. He switched off the engine, opened the car door, and sat listening. Gradually the sounds of the night reasserted themselves. A mile away across the valley, where farms stood and people lived, a dog barked. Mr. Calder took his sleeping bag out of the back of the car. He took off his coat and shoes and wriggled down into the bag. In five minutes Mr. Calder was asleep. It was five o'clock when he woke. It took him five minutes to dress and roll up his sleeping bag. From the back of the car he took a rifle and clipped on a telescopic sight. A handful of ammunition went into his jacket pocket. He walked cautiously towards the brow of the hill. A line of trees led down to the barn, whose roof could now be seen over the slope of the hill. The scrub was thickest round the end tree of the windbreak, and here he propped the rifle and then walked to the wall of the barn. The distance was thirty-three yards. In front of the barn, the path, coming up from the main road, opened out into a flat space, originally a cattle yard. She'll drive in here, thought Mr. Calder, then she'll get out of the car and wait. When he got level with the barn, he saw something that was not marked on the map. It was another track which came across the down and had been made recently by army vehicles from the gunnery school. The army had probably taken over the barn for their manoeuvres. 
Mr Calder didn't think it affected his plans. A civilian car coming from the road would be most unlikely to take this track. Mr Calder returned to the trees and piled stones and a log into a small breastwork. He picked up the rifle and set the sights carefully. Then he sat down and waited. Mrs Lipper arrived at ten to six. She drove up the track from the road and she behaved almost exactly as he had predicted. She drove her car into the yard, opened the car door and got out. Mr Calder snuggled down behind the barrier and centred the sight on her. It was at this moment that he heard a truck coming. It was coming quite slowly along the rough track towards the barn. Mr Calder rose to his knees. The truck had stopped. He could see, although Mrs Lipper could not, a figure in battle dress getting out of the truck. It was, he thought, an officer. He was carrying a light rifle and it was clear that he was out after rabbits. Mr Calder was interested, even in the middle of his extreme irritation, to see that the officer had aimed at a thicket almost directly in line with the barn. Three minutes passed in silence. Mrs Lipper looked twice at her watch. Mr Calder lay down again in a firing position. He had decided to wait. Suddenly the young officer's rifle spoke and Mr Calder squeezed the trigger of his own. So rapid was his reaction that it sounded like a shot and an echo. In front of his eyes, Mrs Lipper folded onto the ground, dead. A moment later the young officer's rifle spoke again. Mr Calder smiled. The timing, he thought, had been perfect. He packed away the telescopic sight and obliterated all signs of his presence. He had left his car facing downhill and all he had to do was take off the handbrake and start rolling quietly down the track. It took three minutes to lift the gate, drive the car through and replace the gate and then he drove off down the road. And that, said Mr Calder some three days later to Mr Fortescue, was that. Mr Fortescue was a square, sagacious looking man and was officially manager of the Westminster branch of the London and Home Counties Bank. No one would have mistaken him for anything but a bank manager, although, in fact, he had other quite important functions. I was sorry, in a way, to saddle the boy with it, but I hadn't any choice, Mr Calder said. He took your shot as the echo of his? Apparently, because he went on shooting. You contemplated that he would find the body, either then or later, said Mr Fortescue, and he would assume that he had been responsible, accidentally, of course. Mr Calder nodded. I think he should receive a good deal of sympathy, he said. The rough shooting belongs to the School of Artillery. Mrs Lipper, in fact, was trespassing on War Department property. Indeed, the police will wonder why she was there at all. They would have wondered, said Mr Fortescue, if her body had been discovered. Mr Calder looked at him. You mean, he said, that no one has been near the barn in the last four days? On the contrary... One of the troops of the 17th Field Regiment, to which your intrusive young officer belongs, visited the barn two days later. It was their gun position. The barn itself was the command post. Either, said Mr Calder, they were very unobservant, or the body had been moved. I was able, said Mr Fortescue, through my influence with the army, to attend the firing as an additional umpire in uniform. I was able to make a thorough search of the area. I see, said Mr Calder. Have you discovered the name of that officer who was out shooting? Yes, he's a National Service boy, a Lieutenant Blakey. His colonel thinks highly of him. Mr Calder nodded. I wonder if the army could find me a battle dress, he said. I see you as a major, said Mr Fortescue, with a 1939 Defence Medal. The Africa Star, said Mr Calder firmly. A week later, Mr Calder, wearing a battle dress blouse which met with difficulty round the waist, was walking up the path which led to the barn. It was late evening, dusk had fallen, and around the farm there was considerable activity as C Troop of the 17th Field Regiment settled down for the night. A sentry saluted Mr Calder, who inquired where he would find the troop commander. He's got his bivvy up there, sir, said the sentry. Mr Calder saw a truck parked on a flat space beyond the barn and enclosed by bushes. Attached to the back of the truck was a sheet of canvas pegged down in the form of a tent. He circled the site cautiously. It seemed to him to be just the right distance from the barn and to have the right amount of cover. It was the place he would have chosen himself. 
He edged up to the opening of the tent and peered inside. A young subaltern was seated on his bedroll, examining a map. Mr Calder stooped and entered. The young man frowned and then smiled. You're one of our umpires, aren't you, sir? he said. Come in, I expect you've been round the gun position. As a matter of fact, said Mr Calder, it was something rather more personal I wanted a little chat about. Yes, sir. When you buried her, Mr Calder said, how deep did you put her? There was silence. The two men might have been on a raft, alone, in the middle of the ocean. Lieutenant Blakey's right hand made a very slight movement outward, checked, and fell to his side again. Four foot into the chalk, he said. How long did it take you? Two hours. Quick work, said Mr Calder. It must have been a shock to you when a night exercise was ordered exactly on this spot with special emphasis on the digging of slit trenches. It would have worried me more if I hadn't been in command of the exercise, said Lieutenant Blakey. I reckoned if I pitched my tent exactly here, no one would dig a trench or a gun pit inside it. By the way, who are you? Mr Calder was pleased to notice that Lieutenant Blakey's voice was under firm control. He told him who he was, and made a proposal to him. He was due to leave the army in a couple of months' time, said Mr Calder to Mr Behrens, when the latter came up for their weekly game of backgammon. Fortescue saw him and thought him very promising. I was very pleased with his behaviour in the tent that night. When I sprung it on him, his first reaction was to reach for the revolver. He realised that he wouldn't be able to get it out in time and decided to come clean. I think that showed decision and balance, don't you? Decision and balance are most important, agreed Mr Behrens. Your throw.